everybody. Welcome back to Capricorn Radio and welcome to Capricorn TV live streaming today. And uh, really excited about today's guest. We're going to be talking to Bruce Fenton with my co-host uh, Heather Elizabeth Osborne. And uh, we have connected with Bruce uh, oh, bet over maybe a year ago now, but it's been a while. We've been so busy to both of us trying to connect on the show. But uh, like all my guests, a little quick bio before I bring him on. Um, Bruce Fenton, born 77 uh, in Cheltenham, England. He's the author and investigative journalist, uh, focused on aspects of the unexplained with subject matter ranging from ancient historical mysteries to supernatural occurrences. He's also featured as a guest on a long list of the online radio shows and provided an article for the print magazine New Dawn about his research on a lost city discovered in the jungles of Ecuador, which is where we are alive today. Uh, so without further ado, let's bring on our super exciting guest. Hi, Bruce. You're very welcome to the show. Hi there, James. Hi, Heather. Great to have you guys here today. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about ancient aliens in Australia. And I know we've spoken to Stephen and Evan Strong before, but you co-authored this book with these guys. I guess we'll focus a little bit on this today, uh, Bruce. Um, uh, I guess before we go with that, what gets you, well, I just alluded to it there, but what gets you to Ecuador? What, why an Englishman in Ecuador, as we were just talking before um, the, the show? Well, I mean, it was kind of a strange situation, but um, if, I, if I go back a bit before, I arrived here in January 2012, um, and just to add a, a layer of weirdness to that, a year before that, a friend of mine who's a, a very capable um, psychic reader and medium was telling me that in 2012 I would be in Ecuador, which I, I thought was just ludicrous. I mean, I was working as an, a lettings agent in Cheltenham, uh, that really wasn't on my radar at all, um, and I just dismissed it, but a, a year later I reconnected with an old friend who um, I didn't know but she was actually half Ecuadorian and she invited me to work with her in Spain uh, teaching English and I did that and then it, it, we decided to move to Ecuador where she had a family property so so it was kind of um, a strange sort of synchronicity really because I, I really had no plans to end up in Ecuador but yeah so that that's kind of how it happened and you know we've, we've remained here since then so early 2012 till now. Oh, wow. Um, tell us what it's like down in Ecuador. I mean, like you say, you, you were going to do a Lost Cities of Giants book there, um, but which may be articles now. Um, there's a lot of mystery in Ecuador. There's a lot of mystery down there. There, are, there is indeed, yes. I mean, I was um, probably like yourselves. I was fascinated by stories of the um, the treasures of Padre Crespi in Cuenca and mm -hmm. some of the finds at La Mana, where they have this strange water that's um, uh, full of monoatomic gold and silver particles. Uh, and also the, I believe, what's the other items? Well, the La Mana collection of objects as well, which were found near there, which are particularly bizarre you know some of them seem to be referencing to a lost civilization you know Atlantis or or maybe um some other but some very strange pieces you know and so this it's a country full of mystery you know you've got Egyptian items Phoenician these kind of Atlantean pieces um you know this so say the strange water then a lost city that we've you know stumbled on in the jungle so um in many ways to me ecuador is almost the hub of strangeness in latin america wow. whereas peru is better known for the of course for the large structures oh wow okay we'll come back to ecuador for sure and uh, if anybody wants to listen along or follow the today's author you can also check out his blog at earthforall.net as we're talking uh, super fascinating blog as well and got a come back to some of the stuff that's on that, uh, Bruce. But uh, here we are to talk today about Ancient Aliens in Australia. Uh, wonderful book. Uh, myself and Heather have got a copy there. Um, it's fascinating. I, I know a lot of the story from Stephen and Evan Strong. I guess, first of all, tell us how you got involved in this project. That'd be the best thing. Uh, actually, yeah, a mutual friend had um, contacted me and said that, you know, you, know, you guys have written about these Pleiadians and uh, you know this sort of strange backstory to this ancient aliens um, event, um, and that you know they said, well, we have these friends, you know, Stephen and Evan Strong in Australia, who are kind of talking about the same information but from a different angle, um, and that it might be beneficial to have a conversation with them and see whether or not there's any overlap there, mm. um, which might help to sort of, I guess, validate the um, the deeper story behind it, uh, and just to see whether there was yeah any sort of helping each other. Um, so we made a call, you know, and we, we spoke to them and they basically, well, came on video Skype like this and uh, made a judgment call that we were, you know, basically honest. You know, obviously a lot of what we've written is, is particularly strange. So, you know, you, to, 
to a degree, it has to be taken either on, on faith, at least initially, or dismissed, you know, because we're not saying that, you know, we have a, a crashed UFO in the garden that we can show someone. So, so they made a judgment call that, that we were at least being honest um, and that it was worth us exploring, you know, a project together, which would then, I guess, cover the physical and the metaphysical. Uh, with us being the, um, myself and Daniela, my wife, being the, the metaphysical half of the book, and then being, of course, the physical. Sure. Wow. Well, Heather, I'm going to bring you in at this point. You, want, you got a question for our super exciting guest today? Okay, great. I wanted to start at where you begin at the beginning of the book with the carry-on glyphs, if that's the correct pronunciation. And if you could give us a little bit of background about that and the duality of the origins for those glyphs that you all have theorized about. Yes, I mean, the, the current understanding is, I mean, firstly, I'll say that most of the academic community dismisses these glyphs, uh, all of the glyphs, uh, entirely. But um, for those that um, are not so dismissive, there appears to be two separate stories recorded into stone at Carryong. Um, I mean, there's three walls. Uh, one of the walls is fairly um, straightforward in that it appears to be uh, proto-Egyptian and tells the story of these uh, Egyptian princes arriving, we think, around 5,000 years ago. Um, on a, a mission, it seems to recover some kind of knowledge from you know Australia and from the people there, um, so obviously the indigenous peoples, uh, and that this tells this tale of you know the, this unfortunate boat wreck and then you know the the prince one of the princes being killed by a snake uh the burial and there's in fact a burial chamber just next to the stones so you know the physical evidence supports this story and there's there's more egyptian glyphs nearby um and some objects that have been found which again seem to back this up um so i guess that would be if, if any story is validated in the very near future i suppose it'll be that one in terms of the academic side because the evidence is becoming particularly strong um, however, the other two walls are a bit more complex because although there is proto-Egyptian, there also appears to be um, Phoenician and um, well, unknown glyphs that, you know, as yet nobody's been able to interpret. Um, and, and another story seems to be recorded there. And in this case, uh, it seems to talk about more of an off-world visitation, that a craft that arrives, a similar story in a way, it's almost as if you say history repeating itself at one site, but uh, that another craft voyaged to Australia, uh, this time, you know, an intergalactic craft, and that has, again, there's a, an event which causes it to disintegrate and some small crafts escape and manage to land and they are marooned there so there's this strange overlap if you like of um, the older tale repeating itself with the Egyptians um, of course academics and indeed most of the public would say you know this just can't have happened it's much more likely that you know if these are fake glyphs or that somebody has uh, misinterpreted them um, but I, I will add to that that there was several years I, I don't know exactly when this was but several years ago uh, another author Valerie Barrow um, wrote a book about this site and she actually managed to speak to about I think it's about 25 people in all that had kind of past life memories uh, of this site um, either spontaneously occurring memories or in some cases through um, hypnotherapy um, but a bit of a mixture and that the the tale that came together really supports this interpretation of the glyphs you know these independent people were all coming up with this story that they had come on a craft uh, that this craft had been um, blown up basically by a rival group uh, and that a small number of survivors had been marooned on earth and that they had tried to continue a mission which they had come to do which was to genetically repair the humanoid creatures on earth which had been meddled with previously and were now I guess we'd call ape-like creatures probably something on the lines of um, maybe Australopithecus or, or, or something like that not particularly advanced would say uh, and so they tried to do their best to then repair the damage that had been done to the genetics uh, with what limited technology was left from the crafts and with the know-how that they had carried with them. So th this is the kind of story that was, you know, that seems to be recorded in the glyphs and to be, you know, told in these past life memories. Um, and we, myself and my wife, also have some related past life memories which tie into this. Although we didn't know Valerie Barrow, you know, when we we initially were writing the book, um, Stephen and Evan told us about them after, you know, after we kind of supplied most of the manuscript. So it was um, quite fascinating, really, to find out that there was 20 or so other people that had connecting memories. Wow. And that's uh, Star People Revisited. That's the name of the book, isn't it? That's right. Yes. 
Yes, um, I think mm -hmm. the full title is uh, "Stop Your Resilience When the First Ancestors Were Created," um, and so that's available. I, I highly recommend that because it gives the really the focuses on the backstory of that visitation and you know how the craft ended up um, destroyed and you know to a degree what the um, the beings that were left did. You know, there's there's blanks which we've tried to um, fill in. You know, from that book, because it doesn't particularly deal so much with the um, I guess the genetic modifications of these beings and you know how how this process could have continued long enough to make it successful which which we cover in our book this uh, what we claim to be kind of a directed reincarnation which allowed these beings to continue this program long enough for it to be successful because in one lifetime you can't really modify a, 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 like an australopithecus type being to become you know an advanced human in a single go you'd have to be I mean, we know from genetic you know um, modifications of animals today you know to perfect something that you want to do would take generations normally wow um i know the guys in australia stephen and evan they've they've had a difficult time against Quackademia, academia, whatever you want to call them, you know, um, and and that's fine. I know that the, the academic world is needed to some extent, but I, they're also uh, not serving the exploration of truth in in any way. Sometimes as well, I know there's a, a confrontation there, and I know the guys are up against it as it is. But to bring in the pleading evidence and the origins of humanity i know that's going to add another layer to it if you want to call it like that so it's it's already a difficult yes. scenario uh, i don't and i know some people don't like that but i don't get it myself bruce because i think you know it wasn't just in australia i mean there's there's been all sorts of ancient aliens uh hypothesis at many ancient sites all around the world and it's like it's okay for that to be there but not to be in australia i don't get it myself i don't get why you know you need to have a safe uh point in history that you can say aliens came but you can't over to something that's not really known about i just don't get it <laughs> you know no i mean i think i suppose partly of course they have this strong academic hatred that originates with the idea that you know that they're tackling the the ancient you know the out of africa issue that they say you know so i mean initially you're going to get a huge amount of hostility for that alone because it's such a sacred cow mm. uh, the idea that we all came out of africa so i mean obviously stephen evan already have that kind of level of i guess disdain from the academic community the original so anything else they put on to that yes is just going to like it's like fuel into the fire really but I, I think probably that in many ways is is the real source of a lot of that animosity is the fact that they're really attacking a sacred cow in science um and that you know had they not been saying that and they just tackled the for the alien stuff if you like perhaps he would have been ignored more and said well okay you know it's another lot to my ancient aliens over but i think because it involves this other you know this other story this um you know the changing this view of known human history mm -hmm. um that they really have been attacked and they were very brave to bring us in i mean at one point they were advised by you know a publisher that you know that it'd be best not to have us involved and i i said honestly if you, if you don't want us just you know if you don't want us to be involved i, I totally understand because i don't want to ruin you know your chances of having your information shared um you know you've been very understanding with us but at the same time i don't want to actually make it harder for you you know which but they were they were very straight and said you know we've said we'll work on it we'll work on it and so, yeah, they went ahead and did it. And I, I have a lot of respect for them for that because I think most people wouldn't have, you know, especially with, well, as I said, already having a lot of trouble, you know, that then to bring that in. Um, but the way they explained it to us was that the elders kept saying to them, look, you know, when are you going to talk about the Plebeians? When are you going to say that, you know, we're telling you this is our history, that they came here and that they are our forefathers? Um, and I suppose it just got to a point, really, for them that they felt, well, we have to talk about it sometime, you know, why not now kind of thing, you know, why not? We've got these people that are, you know, willing to come in with us and give us a bit of their view on the Plydeans and, you know, and it's, I suppose, going to make the elders feel that, you know, you're tackling that side of it, which is what they wanted. Wow. Um, because you provide um, some really compelling stories from the original people, don't you, from the elders, for example, Auntie Beeve, and then the 1896 publication that you discovered of the original elder stories. Well, Steve, Stephen sort of found it, but yes, they, they've, they've got this information now which came from the, some of the information came from an archaeologist in um, in Australia, I, I can't remember the name, I'll be honest, but th there was initial research done on a site which they call now the Australia Stonehenge, which um, in the notes 
of the archaeologist, and this is this guy was the head of the archaeological society, you know, in Australia. So very respected, a lot of credentials, uh, and he interpreted glyphs on these stones, which which basically read like you know sci-fi, because he's he's talking about you know out of out of the darkness they came, you know, bringing the light of truth and you know and coming to earth and and basically kind of retelling this same story that appears on the glyphs, you know, saying that you know, these beings brought this wisdom and that they um, shape basically shape mankind and you know provided all this ancient knowledge. And, but it's you know this is a you know an academic who probably when he first looked at these glyphs was not expecting to to interpret them you know in this way it was you know was very surprised that even there were you know glyphs on a, a huge megalithic site in australia a place where it was pretty much looked at as there should be nothing because the people there were supposed to be you know monkey-like humanoids um rather than you know advanced human beings like everyone else and as we know the english treated them as such you know that they were little more than animals uh, and did their best to eradicate them so the fact that um, you know a an archaeologist nearly a hundred years ago would was willing to even talk about the idea that there was a site there with writing on it um, for a start was pretty amazing. But then the interpretation really is pretty mind blowing because it again just tells this same story of you know this coming out of the darkness and arriving on Earth and you know bringing this light of wisdom with them. So it's, it's pretty mind bending, and I think as people start to look into some of the other sites that um, Stephen and Evan have been working on, including this Stonehenge site, uh, but also un you know, areas with underground tunnels which show megalithic blocks in the tunnel structure that are similar to Peru and to elsewhere, um, and a number of sites with enormous megalithic blocks you know, involved in what looked like you know, ruined constructions. Um, it really gives a, a paints a picture of there having been a, a very widespread and fairly advanced civilization in Australia mm. a very, very long time ago. I mean, way before recorded history. Wow. Uh, what can we know um, either from the elders or the glyphs or the messages or the research from about the Palladian beings? Physical description, any description, mm. intention? Um, did they get the job done? Did they get us fixed? Or, uh, you know, tell us a little bit more the background of the story of the Palladians. Sure. Um, I would sort of concur, really, with uh, most of what Valerie has said, which is that essentially this craft arrives with the intention of modifying these humanoid beings. Um, but that, you know, if you take on board that the perfect mission would have been, of course, that this craft, I suppose, arrives, sends down all the scientific equipment that it has on board, the experts that are on board, and that, you know, they modify these beings in a, in a perfect manner over a period of time, um, and that, you know, then everything would have been fixed, I guess, and you could say, you know, they would have left, and everything been happy, happy, it's all done. But with the um, this other side story, which basically is that another group of reptilian-type beings uh, ambushes this craft and destroys it in orbit, that you're kind of left with a very imperfect situation with you know a small number of beings and I would say when you say Pleiadians I mean I'll just clarify here because from my perspective this is a, a, sure. a group of different types of beings that have come together on a craft to do something and they originate from the direction of the Pleiades star cluster. I, I don't think that any of these beings probably have a home world in the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. The Pleiades is, a, is a, pretty, a pretty young star birthing cloud. Pretty it's, hot, yeah it's, pretty hot. Yeah, it's, it's very unlikely that there's, a, there's any worlds there that have been there long enough for advanced life to actually, you know, to exist on them. If they're there, then it's artificially, you know, it's either artificial bases or they're terraformed worlds. Because, you know, we have to be sort of realistic and say that, you know, these, these stars are not really generally ready to be, you know, giving up life. Um, my view of it is that they came from that direction and that there are worlds in that direction, but they're not necessarily in the Pleiades star cluster. I mean, if you arrive and you're trying to explain to, to um, a non-advanced civilization where you come from, it's pretty easy just to point and say, well, it's, you know, over there, you see those bright stars over there, we're from around there, you know, but that doesn't mean they necessarily live in the Pleiades. But these beings were of different types. I mean, as, as Valerie has described, some would look a bit like greys, yeah. Others that we would personally we, we feel more aligned to are uh, tall human looking beings of a with a kind of a it's a bluish kind of skin. If you imagine the surface of a pearl, it's rather grayish, bluish, whitish colour, um, very tall, typically between sort of seven to nine feet in height, um, fairly slim build, you know, an odd looking person by any you know any standard today. But that 
is the group that myself, my wife, and some of the other people I know would say that we are reborn from, if you like, and we're dealing with reincarnation here. I mean, I'm, clearly I, I don't look like a, an eight-foot-tall blue being. So um, we are talking about a reincarnational history. Um, there were other beings involved. I mean, uh, certainly from her description, some were robotic-type beings and silicon-based life, and some very strange beings that were involved in this. But So when we say Pleiadians, you know, it's... It has a kind of a, you know, a myth of in the, in the New Age and, and in uh, ufology, sure. um, generally associated with what people call tall whites, mm -hmm. but, which basically are just tall white people from the general description, um, which I think may be a, a, bit of a bit of a misnomer, a bit of, where someone perhaps saw one of these beings. And if you said the closest kind of color, you know, you might say, well, it looked like a tall white person, but they're not actually white, not the Pleiadians that I would, you know, align to, I'd say. They're, they're a slightly bluish color, so they're mm -hmm. definitely not, you know, Aryans, which I think there's a lot of um, confusion there, that this idea that once upon a time some advanced Aryans went around the world, you know, making everything happen. And it's obviously there's an alignment there to certain, um, I guess, white supremacist type thinking, which is, is problematic. You know, I mean, yeah. you go into a whole side debate there, really, because I, I mean, I, I always sort of find that a bit of a. It's a bit of a, a dodgy subject because, you know, of course, if you start saying that, yeah, if you start saying, oh, well, there was these white beings and they did everything, particularly to non-white cultures that have suffered a lot under, you know, colonialism, it, it doesn't sound very good. But, well, I'm going to have from to... my perspective, anyway, I don't... Sorry. I'm going to have to let down some of my Facebook uh, people then because they keep calling me a Pleiadian with them. I'm tall, I'm tall, six foot three, and I've got big blue eyes and they just think I'm a Pleiadian. <laughs> so, you but. may well be, but, I mean, as I say, I mean, it's... You know, none of us look, none of us look quite like them. I'd say that they are. You know, they're alien looking. I mean, they don't gotcha. look gotcha. the same as. I mean, do you remember a case? Um, I think it was. I may have this wrong. Was it Colin Wilson that Colin a few Wilson. years back near Stonehenge that there was two beings seen by a police officer, uh, and that these two beings had sort of white, close fitting clothes, a slightly bluish skin, mm -hmm. and he said they were near to a, a crop circle. And as he sort of watched them, they moved at incredible speed. Um, and then just vanished. I mean, that would be a fairly accurate description of Pleiadians. Very tall, slightly bluish skin, typically wearing white, fi white fitted clothes. They can move incredible speeds. They can perform very, very amazing feats of agility and also have in incredible strength, incredible psychic gifts. Um, he was left with all sorts of headaches and problems from even being near them. So, I mean, that would be, I would say, the best modern wow. sighting of these types of beings that I know of. Um, and then again, from an expert witness, from a police officer who really had everything to lose by even saying that he'd seen these beings. So it's not that they're no longer around either. So uh, when we talk about ancient aliens, some of these beings, you know, they still do visit. Uh, and you'll see the same beings depicted by um, shamans in South America from ayahuasca experiences. Oh, yeah. There's um, a number of remarkable pictures that show what I would say is classic Pleiadians. Uh, the skin color, absolutely, perfectly how it's right, with this kind of pearl-like, slightly bluish skin. I mean, I, so I'll pull up some pictures and send them to you, but there's some really amazing pictures of what I would say are Pleiadians. Because we're talking about hyperdimensional beings that can appear in the physical or also appear in, in sort of five dimensions. So, you know, a shaman can be sitting in trance and interact with one just as one could land theoretically and kind of have a spaceship because of, you know, it's um, a very advanced race, very advanced civilization with an understanding of, you know, higher dimensional physics. Otherwise, you couldn't come here for a start. Hmm. Heather, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, you've had your own really powerful shamanic experiences, haven't you, Bruce? Um, can you share with us a little bit about your first experience when you realized you had a past life connection to the Pleiades? Yes, I mean, there's, there's two particular experiences, I suppose, which now I fully understand relate to. The first one, yes, was um, I, I first became sort of, I guess, involved with shamanic practices back in about 2001. Um, and one of my sort of experiments with that was um, I actually ate Hawaiian baby woodrose seeds, which are, um, they contain LSA. They're a, a kind of a traditional you know, method of entering an altered state of consciousness. And during that experience, I had well, three different experiences, two of them are not really relevant here, but one of them, I found myself suddenly not myself, as this very tall, um, you know, different shaped person, um, piloting a craft, uh, being pursued. I could see that the earth was below me. I was heading down towards it. There was an awareness that I was part of a larger group and that something had gone terribly wrong and that most of these beings were dead uh, and that I was, you know, basically being pursued towards the surface of the planet. I, I knew that there'd been some kind of betrayal. 
and I could, I was aware I was wearing this blue uniform, this kind of blue outfit. Um, not sure if there was anyone else on the craft, it didn't really come up, but um, certainly that was my first kind of, if you like, uh, a link to like an alien type experience where it was clear I wasn't, you know, a normal human um, and that, you know, piloting a craft which was very unlike, I guess, human crafts. I mean, so I mean, normally we can't fly very far into space, as you know, I mean, unless you chug along to the moon, you know, when those are rockets. But yeah, it wasn't like that, you know, it was an advanced craft, able to go at high speeds, etc. Um, and that was my first experience of that. And then after that, I kind of didn't know what to do with that. This is obviously a long time ago and I didn't have any reference point to attach that to. I didn't really know anything about Pleiadians particularly and I had a, a very basic knowledge of ufology just as someone interested in the unexplained um, but I, I really couldn't relate it to any other stories I'd heard or anything. So so I just left that, you know, it just got left as one of those strange experiences you have. And then, well, I suppose a couple of years later I had another experience which at the time I didn't know related to this at all either which was I was talking in a chat room to um, a couple of other psychics, and this was for the Hafani Coed Spiritualist Centre, which is in the Brecon Beacons, which I know that, I, I think, James, you've mentioned being to that area. You make it, but it's um, a small, yeah, spiritualist centre, uh, and they run all sorts of courses. But I was in their chat room having a conversation with someone about, uh, I think, just about some kind of holistic therapies, or it was, you know, nothing particularly exciting. Um, and then in the middle of this conversation, like that, bang, I'm no longer there in the room. I'm flying through the air. I don't know if I have physical body. It feels like I have my body. I'm flying through the air above a jungle scene. There's you know, an emerald green canopy below me, uh, and I'm heading towards what I can see is a kind of a white-stepped pyramid ahead of me. And this is a shining white pyramid. So, I mean, on some level, I'm kind of aware this is weird because, you know, today, you know, Mayan, Aztec pyramids are I mean, for anyone who's seen them, they're pretty grey, really. You know, they've um, been attacked by the elements for a very long time. And to see this shining white structure, I knew this had been very recently built. It like, may not even been finished being built. It was so sort of shiny new. And as I came in closer, I started to have some awareness. There's information you're just picking up from the background that this is a, a, the hub of some civilization that I can't see and that this is a kind of a, a beacon to them, this shining white structure, you know, the sun literally glaring off of it. Um, we get closer and closer. I can see there's a man standing on top of this pyramid, tall, um, in sort of not much clothes, very shamanic -y looking. I guess you think of a, a North American medicine man um, in a kind of traditional outfit, a bit like that. Um, certainly not a modern person by any stretch, you know, someone indigenous, and holding this staff, he's doing some kind of ritual on top of the roof. I don't remember any sound from this experience, you know, all the information I got was just intuitional. Um, get close enough, I realise that there's, somehow I know that there's a secret tunnel goes down into this structure, and I know a few other things, but, okay, very weird experience. Stops, bang, you know, back in my room, I think, well, you know, what the heck is that? I mean, I've had a number of psychic and, you know, supernatural experiences, from 15 onwards. So, I mean, in, in that context, I say it probably didn't freak me out as much as it would some people, but it, it still was remarkable. Um, and then I continued talking to the woman. I said, like, you know, something really strange just happened. She said, yes, you know, were you flying through the air towards a pyramid? And I, yes, she says, I was there with you. She says, I, I saw it as well. She says, and I was given that the year was, um, it was 675 AD. And she said, and also that the experience was meant to be for you, not for me, which, you know, couldn't make any sense of really anyone because I wasn't involved with Mayans or Aztecs. So, you know, so it's like, why is it for me? You were there as well. I, you know, I have no connection to this. Um, and that led to my research into the Mayans and into 2012. I spent seven years running a website, 2012rising.com. Changed my course of my life entirely, really, because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time focused on trying to understand, you know, why that had happened, you know, what was important about that area, um, where that might have been, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, so really spent a long time involved with even going to sites like Palenque, which I identify now as being that site that, that was part of the Palenque complex. Uh, in fact, I believe it's the um, the Templo Olvedad, which is um, the lost temple, which is uh, in the in the forest nearby to the main site. People can go to it with guides. Um, and that site actually, you know, I feel was where it was happening. Now, much later, you know, fast forward again, you know, the experiences my, my wife Daniela has in Ecuador, which kind of, you know, really get this all going again, which is in 2012. She begins having shamanic type experiences, journeys, where they're taking her to Palenque and eventually becomes explain to her that both of us have had this life there, 
where we are these hybrids living there and so that this man who was on top of the temple is my past self who was doing something to call me back there because he wants to share this information with me but the, the thing fails and my suspicion is because this other woman is pulled into the experience that somehow it it stops it from functioning that she shouldn't really have been there and that's why this being says this experience was for him not for you and that the, the whole thing stops and bang we're back in our own rooms and then they try again but this time with my with my wife who I consider to be my my twin flame and you know my life partner and they pull her in instead and she gets the full experience of what they wanted to do which is showing her these sites under the city um, remarkable things you know laboratories you know all sorts of strange things which are, I believe are still under Palenque I should stop there let you just look at a lot of no, that's great that's great including a, a hall of records correct that they said that existed there still yeah, so Hall of Records, which contains um, different types of records. There were some of the things were green tablets, which re immediately reminded me of the Emerald Tablets of Foth, because you know, having um, seen the information about the, just the physical descriptions of these, you know, they, she saw crystalline type tablets with runic type writing on large numbers of these, uh, a collection of crystal skulls, of various colours, um, and then other recordings, just you know, engravings on walls and stuff in strange glyphs and things. So I uh, said so that they seem to have a collection of different types of records that they've gathered together to protect under Belenge. Um, the crystal skull is particularly important. They play a key role in a lot of what she's shown because there's a, an ongoing attempt by another group of these tall greys who are continually trying to get hold of these skulls. And it's explained to her that if you have all of these, you know, original skulls you can do really incredible things you can modify the weather you can change you know you can cause earthquakes you can do all sorts of strange things so they're particularly worried about these falling into any wrong hands um, and she's pretty much continually given you know tasks by the then lord of Palenque who's Lord Hanab Pakal to basically hide these and to keep moving them and hiding them and and then they manu he manufactures copies of them which they leave to be to be um, kind of taken away by these other groups very bizarre and I should add to this you know it's not it's not channeling or something where you know we're sitting in the room and you know we both you know oh let's see what we can get or there's nothing like this at all I mean particularly for Daniela it was a nighttime thing you know she'd lie down and you know as if you're gonna go to bed like a, a normal night she'd suddenly feel you know she needs to lie down and then would just be like bang she'd go through a wall you'd feel like an energetic barrier particularly painful literally the feeling of being pulled into millions of pieces to pass through this barrier horrendously painful and I've seen her pretty much scream almost screaming in pain a couple of times with that um, and then on the other side of this these experiences happen and do you believe that these tall greys that were malicious, that were concocting a plan at that time in, in Palenque, that they were involved later in other aspects of destruction or, or earlier, in fact, in terms of Atlantis or other, you know, malicious plots that were involved in the history of our world? Yeah, I think so. And I think I would probably associate them with the Gnostic Archons. I think that they're probably they're one and the same, that these tales of these, you know, archonic beings that have sort of, I guess, plagued us throughout history. Um, but they also seem to be associated with these reptilian. Some you know, there may be various types of reptilians and various types of greys. That's certainly for anyone who looks at ufology and reports of you know um, alien visitations. There does seem to be multiple types of similar looking beings. So, and I will just say that I can't say that all grey looking, you know, the grey type beings and all reptilians are evil. I, I don't know that. But there's certainly at least two groups of these beings, you know, which are are not in the best interest of humanity. The, these particular tall greys who are working with these small greys, but the, the small greys very much seem to be their lackeys. You know, the, I can't even say for sure if these small greys are bad or whether they just have been enslaved and are just being made to do things. I mean, I know a lot of people say in their reports of abductions that when they're on craft that the tall greys are stood behind making the small greys do the experiments and to do all these other things. So. I'd say that the tall greys are really the malicious element in the story, in that, in that story of abductions and these past events, as are at least one group of reptilian type beings. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole sort of um, additional bit of exopolitics going on in this scenario as well, because the first experience that my wife had, she is taken down into a, an area in Palenque, and I should just add here that she's not in her normal body. She's in a, a much taller, much stronger body, um, and he becomes aware that you know this is not you know 
her normal self. Uh, enters a room where there's a group of other very tall, you know, people dressed in Mayan traditional clothes but that are way too tall for Mayan people. Um, the typical Mayan of the time was around about five foot, you know, and these people are more like seven and a half foot, you know. Um, so they stand out straight away as being, you know, odd. Uh, and they're having this debate. There's a, one group who is saying that they, sh they need to work with these tall greys, that they need their technology, their, their know-how, particularly of genetic engineering. Um, and there's another group saying that they, they shouldn't work with them because they're completely untrustworthy and that you know, there will be they would almost certainly double cross them at some point um, but in the end because the leader is kind of on the side of the well we can form a treaty that benefits us um, for the moment that they sort of go ahead with it um, and the idea is that there's there's an upcoming war that they need to enhance their warriors to fight. It's not made completely clear who this war is with. I mean, I know that historically Palenque fought a couple of wars with um, with a nearby city-state, which is basically the um, the city of the snakes, which is a kind of funny kind of tie-in. So one has to wonder, you know, are, are these um, reptilians basically running one city, and these Pleiadian hybrids are running another city, and that you know, they sporadically are fighting a war with each other. Uh, that's certainly the the gist that you know we've come away from it with. Um, not 100% sure on that, but that certainly seems to be. I don't know why else they would need this technology to fight an, a, a normal Mayan state. I mean, they should be able to easily defeat them with the knowledge they have and with the beings they're involved, because the Bladean hybrids are much stronger. There's no way a normal Mayan soldier could kill one. No way. I mean, at some points they're moving at almost lightning speeds, where it's almost impossible to see them. Some of the fights between some of these beings, you know, for a normal person to watch would see just you know, something just move around the room at high speed. They wouldn't really know these beings were there. So, so you know, they're not really people that you could go in to fight with it with swords and expect to beat them. Um, so there's something else going on here. Uh, and in the end, this treaty is made. There is this agreement to work in the labs to enhance the strength of some of the soldiers. Uh, I guess you, the first super soldiers, I guess you might say. Um, I know that even today people talk about super soldier programs going on in the secret, you know, with obviously with our clandestine governments, which are, you know, probably very similar. Um, and that these, you know, these beings kind of are there under the city, these tall greys, and also these hybrids. Mostly they are under the city. You know, on the general rule, some of them, you know, the higher caste people, you know, the king and others are up on the surface, obviously have to do things. But most of the, the stranger stuff is going on below ground. Um, I think that a lot of these labs can still be accessed. You know, if, if I, to be honest with you, if I could go to Mexico again with my wife, we would be looking to find an entrance into these areas um, and to prove this. Because, of course, I mean, you know, I believe uh, to some degree in the scientific method and in proof, you know, that, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, ultimate of this would be to enter those labs and to show what's in there and to find possibly this hall of records uh, at least to see the glyphs on the walls if other things have been moved and to um, to validate this because I, I strongly feel that we can do that that it doesn't have to remain as kind of just believe me you know could you comment on the uh, Crespi yeah. collection uh, by the Crespi's collection in Ecuador what you think about it sure mm -hmm. yeah I mean the some of the pieces in Ecuador, which you know, kind of tie into the certainly the idea of a, a lost civilization. I mean, it may be that they tie into the alien visitation. Um, in, in the Crespi collection, you have some really, you know, incredible pieces, a, a, a wide range. I mean, there's, you know, for people who don't know, Father Crespi basically said that, you know, he was working with the Shwa, which is an indigenous tribe in the in the Oriente in the jungles here, uh, and that they really revered him as a saint. Because he did so much for them, you know, he was always trying to help. He had a, a fair amount of personal wealth. Um, he would, you know, he would arrange for medical help for people. He would do all sorts of really nice charitable acts, and so they became to so sort of trust him and to so revere him that they would thank him by bringing him presents out of the jungle. He said these presents would be, you know, strange pieces of, you know, either. Uh, technology, sometimes pipes and strange cogs and gears, and and other times they would be, you know, metal plates, you know, gold plates, silver plates, covered in ancient symbols. Um, other pieces, you know, helmets, crowns, armor, you know, a really wide range of artifacts. In the end, he collected seventy thousand artifacts. He had the the single largest museum collection in Ecuador, you know, larger than the official, you know, Quito Museum and everybody else put wow. together. So. Absolutely extraordinary. I mean, you've got 70,000 pieces coming out of the jungle from a tribe who were considered to be basically Stone Age tribes. And then wow. some people say oh, that these guys were faking it. But you have to really then say, well, 
you know, how is a, a tribe that should be Stone Age out in the jungle, you know, running some giant furnace, you know, melting steel and gold and silver and banging out all of, you know, 70,000 artifacts you know, of armor and plates covered in Sumerian and Egyptian and Babylonian, you know, there's a point where you have to say, look, that's not the answer. You know, that is not a valid response to what you, the artifacts, you know, uh, one, one poignant um, comment made by someone was that you know, why on earth would a, a fraudster fake an object in pure gold and then sell it to someone at less than the value of the gold itself? And that was commonly happening with, with Crespi. So, I mean, it, it, it's a nonsense to say that these people were trying to just hoax him. He admits himself that he bought pieces that were fake. He said, I, I want to keep these people bringing me real things and I also want to, you know, not to embarrass them by saying in front of people, you know, that's a load of rubbish, throw it in the bin. So he said I would give them a small amount of money and just buy them, buy the fake pieces as well and just put them away somewhere. Clever. So, you know, he admitted himself that. But that's clever, that's a clever approach. It is. You know, he gets attacked for that but it kept the real artifacts flowing out of the jungle. Um, and what is even stranger, if you like, again, we're going to the underground here, because he said that the, the Schwa told him that most of the artifacts were coming from an extensive tunnel network underneath the jungle. Um, they said there were also temples and pyramids on the surface, ruined, um, but that most of the artifacts were hidden inside a vast tunnel network, and that the walls of these tunnels were absolutely mirror-like, you know, in, in terms of the smoothness and the reflectivity. Uh, it sounds like they had been melted or in some way, you know, uh, vitrified or some chemical had been put on them. This wasn't just, you know, a, a normal, I guess, rough-hewn cave system or, you know, something of that. Like, it, it sounded itself as though this, the site was particularly bizarre. Um, the temples and pyramids that were described by the local Shua as glowing blue at night, as though that inside that they had been coated in some kind of material that literally lit the inside. Uh, and that's a reference I've, I've heard come up elsewhere in Egypt and other places, that sites which can glow at night, um, this some kind of lost technology, a paint that's maybe bioluminescent. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but very strange descriptions of the sites where these people are getting these artifacts from. It almost kind of beckons back to either an ancient alien question or, or halls of records of, you know, maybe they're dotted all around the planet from a... A lot of people think if there was a global cataclysm or several cataclysms that we had halls of records dashed all around the planet as little safe havens for mm -hmm. the knowledge. Absolutely. I mean, you probably both know about Casey's predictions of, you know, yeah. the, the free halls of records, you know, with the one being obviously in Egypt, most likely somewhere deep under the Sphinx. And, you know, we all know that, OK, there's you know evidence that that exists, that, you know, that there's chambers certainly under that area. Well, I mean. There's more chambers and tunnels at the Giza Plateau than there is buildings, I would say, because at this point, from what I understand, I mean, I've been into some areas. I have friends that have been into much deeper and much more exciting areas with you know, a vast lake, you know, a huge cavern under the Giza site, uh, which, which the, research, the official scientists have been down into because there was rubber boats and things down there. Um, so they're going down you know, regularly and taking artifacts out. I went into one area which uh, out... I think it's to the west of the pyramids in the desert there, but on the Giza Plateau. There's a giant fence goes right around the site for people that haven't been there and, you know, won't know that. But of course, you know, locals... They call it the Hawass Wall, the, the Wall the of Hawass. Hawass Wall. I said, within there was all his treasures. He was busy stealing, you know. And unfortunately, you know, I think he got a lot. But, you know, I was taken to one site um, through a, a friend, you know, and, you know, his contacts. And this was really strange site because you know it's out away from the pyramids you can see the pyramids from there but you wouldn't be able to see this site because the structures are quite small but they really remind you straight away of some kind of bunkers they, they, they are concrete look like concrete bunker type structures but the, the, there's a one entrance goes in you go down a few steps and then it kind of splits so it's about three of these bunkers and then you try to take a turn and then there's one of these square perfect square shafts which people will see in front of the pyramids the, the shaft very similar um you climb down there's only handholds in the walls just you know it's very old you can see they're very worn scaled down carefully so there was a cave network and then within there it's that was, I'd say the cave network was um, an enhanced natural cave network. And then from in there, there was, well, there was bones, there was of the remains of sarcophagus, people who had chosen to be buried there, high profile people, because these were remnants of beautiful sarcophagus. And then the tunnels would go further down to other shafts, which dropped down so deep that you can't go down without, you know, climbing equipment. But the minute you go in, particularly if you're intuitive, there's this sense of 
people running into this place, you know, that this is a, a, somewhere they ran to for safety that, and they went down and that they, they didn't come back up. That they, it's, too, it's so deep, some of these touch shafts, that you can't imagine how they ever came back up. That these people went down, they moved down there to get away from something. And, you know, my suspicion would be that if we ever went down there, we'll find either the obvious remnants of their civilization or maybe them. You know, I, I don't discount that. I mean, my wife's had experiences, particularly in um, astral travel dreams, where she's been down into some of those areas. And the beings there have said, look, if you ever have real trouble, you guys, you can come down and join us down here. And some really strange experiences. And I know that my um, my friend Richard Gabriel, who I don't know if you've ever had one, but he, he does a lot of work out in, um, in Egypt. He's described some astral experiences, you know, from experiments he's done out there of entering chambers on the astral there and seeing some remarkable things, you know, and on the top of the pyramid and elsewhere. Um, so, I mean, you have this, yeah, as you say, this underground kind of labyrinth there and around the world, many others. I mean, I, so I could go on and on. I know I end up talking over you, but I'll just quickly say that in going back to Mexico, fine, yeah, because Bruce, Casey, because <laughs> if uh, Casey, I'll go back to Mexico. We, one of the sites he talked about was the Yucatan. You know, he says that, you know, we will find another one of these sites somewhere under a, the complex out in the Yucatan and there'll be, you know, another hall of records revealed there. And when I was in Mexico back in, um, 2010 I think it was I went to a site I'm not going to say where it is just because you know I don't like to encourage someone else to go and then maybe particularly nefarious people to go there and just you know take everything out of it all but uh, we we were visiting a site which is mostly rebuilt it wasn't a particularly impressive complex to be honest in a way because it's heavily rebuilt and it was almost a bit cartoonish I felt because you can see that they had um, put it back together for the benefit of tourists largely um, and myself and my friend were kind of you know wandering off to one side and we noticed a strange hole which was um probably not much bigger than a, a you know a, a well for a bucket you know probably that kind of bit smaller probably but enough you put a bucket down and we thought oh it must be some kind of dry you know water system because you could look down and see a tunnel inside and then there was a nearby there was a one of the sort of park so sort of, I guess the groundsmen, I don't know what you'd call them, but one of the, the official, you know, one of the guys from the, the Pyramid Park, um, an old Mayan chap. And we sort of asked him, he said, you know, what is this? Is this a, a well or something? And he said, oh, no, no, no. You know, it's down there. He says, there's sort of a tunnel system. And he, he explained to us, he said, he says, many years ago, he says, a group of archaeologists from the US came here. And he said, and I was charged with going with them to this site, at the, the entrance to the tunnel system, he said, where they did a dig. And he said, initially they found a very strange burial with a, a chest. And on either side were two skeletons sitting with their heads in their laps, you know, the skulls in their laps, buried around this chest. And he said, so obviously that was the first really strange element. He said, but then the, the entrance itself, he said, you know, we, we sort of went into and we entered this tunnel system and it went on and on, he said, for kilometers. And he said, and there was signs of, of wheel tracks and the mines didn't have wheels. He said, there was wheel tracks inside. And he said, and then we noticed there were kind of holes going down. I said, well, look, what do you mean? Are you talking about a multi-layered like catacombs. And he said, yes, absolutely. He said, and it's kilometers of tunnels under there. And he said, and as we went further in, a strange noises started to happen. He said, and, the, and these became more and more bizarre to the point where the archaeologists got so scared, they fled the tunnel network. And he said, and they've never returned to this site. And he said, and in our view, this is a bad place. He says, we, we feel that, you know, there's a lot of negative paranormal activity here at night, you know, very off-putting. So that, you know, we have objects thrown at us, stones are thrown at us. You know, we see duendes, which is loosely speaking is child spirits, a kind of trapped spirits here. Uh, and very, you know, Whilst there's, there's, the funny is, you know, you've got these Europeans there that are doing these rituals of like, you know, positive, you know, and oh, we're going to open up the site. And for the Mayans, they're like, no, we don't really like to go on the site. You know, it's, it's got all this weird energy here. There's something really, you know, off-putting and there's these tunnels and, you know, so it's, it's really sort of funny. Then you sort of get the Mayan view of these sites, some of them, that they're a bit more like, a bit more cautious. And that, you know, there was certainly the, the suggestion there that there's a, a huge catacomb system there. And that would be my, and this is in the Yucatan. There's a, a very ancient Mayan site in the Yucatan with kilometers of tunnels under it so i have a strong suspicion that this is the site that casey's talking about and again if i ever had the chance with a group of people that are willing to go and do a bit of you know caving and climbing um i would be very happy to go down there and see what's down there i mean despite the off-putting noises I, I think that that's pretty much a show to keep away you know people that really don't know what they're doing and, um so I, again i think these sites are very valid i think there's a number of these probably you know more than three i think there are 
catches of knowledge all over the planet. Uh, Bruce, I want you to do me a favour and take a moment to give out the people your wonderful websites, um, uh, where they can catch you, the book for the website and your personal blog as well. Just just give them all out there and people will follow along. And then I'm going to throw the last question to Heather. Sure. OK. Um, yeah, so my main site, um, Earth for All, and that's the number four, Earth for All dot net. And uh, yeah, my secondary site would be Bruce Fenton dot info. And either of those, are, you know, they can follow on things I'm doing. Uh, Bruce Fen the Bruce Fenton dot info, I'm going to try and put more of the articles about the site in Ecuador on that shortly. Um, but yeah, they find some of that already on Earth for All. Uh, and the book of the ancient aliens is on there. Ancient aliens in Australia is on the sites. Ancient aliens in Australia, and you know what I love about the the websites is there's there's wonderful stuff there. Mysteries, uh, mysteries are abound. Esoteric spirituality, consciousness studies, uh, mysteries. Uh, you must be. Uh, you must be really attached to this area of research, Bruce. I mean, you don't put this together or get this enthralled by something unless you're passionate about it. So I can I can see that in the website. So I, I do want to draw attention to get people over there and, and catch it there. Heather, have you got one last question before we wrap things up? Yeah, I do. I was just curious, you know, in terms of the visionary experiences that you and Daniela have had, is there some kind of prediction that you can share with us in terms of a hope? for a new humanity, for things to shift, that the Palladian agenda in terms of uh, reconstructing our world might have a positive outcome in the future sometime. Yes, I mean, I, I strongly feel that, you know, that these beings and others being trying to sort of guide our more towards a, a, a universal consciousness that, you know, particularly if we look at the messages that come through from, say, shamans and people that are contacting these beings regularly, you know, that usually the information is beneficial, even, you know, to do with, you know, healing work or to do with, you know, ways that they could better structure their, their societies. You know, on the whole, I'd say that the contact information is aimed at, you know, progressing humanity. Um, and of course, sometimes there's things come through a bit more scary and things that, you know, warnings and stuff. But I mean, overall, it, it does certainly seem it's nudging us in the right direction to become what I would say we probably once were, you know, a planet that was part of a, a larger global community. Um, and that that is the intention of these various beings. I, I'm not going to say that there's never any, you know, nefariousness or trickstering and you know all sorts of strange things happen but um, I also feel that we've entered a time now and I, I do relate a bit to 2012 that you know that this new paradigm that the old understandings seem to be flooding back in the form of you know look at some of these ancient sites that have turned out recently like uh, Gunan Padang and, um, and obviously uh, in Turkey a number of sites there which you know are showing that you know our civilization goes back way way back from you know before not 6,000 years ago more than 12,000, you know, keep going back. I'd say, you know, it just goes back and back and back. So, I mean, I think that this is all coming out this time because it's the time when the, the ancients return and this energy of the ancients is returning. So my view of it is very positive that, you know, we are in that time now when it goes back to the beginning, which was a better beginning. Wow. Well, we're Fantastic. going to wrap it up. We're going to wrap it up with that, guys. Uh, Bruce Fenton dot info for today's author and Earth for All uh, dot net. If you want to check out Bruce's blog, I just love the information. And I love the mysteries and I love the research, Bruce. So finally, we got there. Uh, thank you for today's show, Heather. Uh, thank you too. Thank you. Great. Thank you. thank you both. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. Very much. Really, appreciate it. really appreciate it. Hope to talk to you again. Hope to talk to you again. Okay. For sure. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs>